Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Alex Avila with Love University. And we're back. I'm an author, psychologist, and speaker. Every week, we talk about how to love ourselves, others, and a higher nature, how to improve our finances, career, health, relationships, and spirituality. And we have a really interesting guest today. This is Annette Macias. Annette is an author who tells stories about love, family, and following your dreams. Uh, she has a BA in communication. Uh, she was a reporter and editor for the LA Times, currently works in corporate communications. And she also writes romance novels under the name of Sabrina Soul. She is proud of her Mexican-American heritage, culture, and traditions, and lives in Los Angeles with her three children and four dogs. Welcome, Annette, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Now, here's one question, though. You have one more dog than children. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, actually. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but actually, unfortunately, we are now down to three dogs. Oh, again. We, okay. We oh, just lost we just lost oh, one recently. Sorry to hear so. that. Well, dogs are loving as children can be loving, right? So yes. you have to get yes. a lot of love. Uh, and you also chose a, a pen name, um, Sabrina Soul. What did you choose a pen name and, and that particular name for your romance? Um, so I you know, when I first became published, I first became published in in romance. And that was just something um, that seemed that authors did was write under a pen name. And I just thought it would be, you know, kind of fun and interesting to create this different persona. Right. And my romance books, like my women's fiction books, um, are focused on Latina characters. So I wanted readers to know that I was a Latina writer. So I knew I wanted to have a um, Spanish last name. So mm -hmm. that's why I chose Sol, S-O-L. Ah. And then I just like the alliteration of right. having, you know, a, you know, a first name with an S also. Right. And also it means son, I guess. So you're a bright person, I guess, or, you know, it's a positive yes. thing. Yes. Now you have a, a very interesting book uh, called uh, Big Chicas Don't Cry. And it's a love relationships, I guess, and loss kind of book. So I'll give you a, a little bit of it. And I want you to expand upon it and see, uh, tell me more about it. So from the intro, it says four inseparable cousins love each other, but then one of them moves away. I guess there was a divorce, and they also love their abuelita as well. But then when they're older now, they get together, and one of them going through maybe a, a problems with their marriage. Another one, he said, is not Mexican enough for a family and not white enough for her colleagues. Another one is, um, I guess, in the uh, as a nun or something, uh, and she has a secret crush. So tell us about these ladies and what's going on right now in their lives. Um, yeah, so Big Chicas Don't Cry follows four Mexican American cousins. There, there is a pair of sisters in there as well, um, who grew up very close and basically were were more like sisters than cousins, and grew up very uh, close with their uh, great grandmother, who they call Wedita, and um, the book opens up with them as teenagers. And then the next time we see the cousins, they're adults. And um, the reader can see that one of the cousins, um, Mari, is kind of estranged from the family. So, you know, you know, you as the book goes on, then you kind of learn the reasons why. So it, it really is about the four cousins um, coming back together with their family after um, they experience a tragedy. And it also follows them individually and what they're going through with their careers and with their romantic relationships. And as you mentioned, um, Madi is the one who is um, having problems in her marriage. Um, Erica is the cousin who um, is having problems in her career as a newspaper reporter with a, with a new boss. Um, and then the sisters, um, Gracie, she's not a nun, but she does work mm. at a Catholic mm. school, but she's a first grade teacher. She's very conservative. And so she faces some, you know, personal challenges when, um, uh, with the new uh, PE teacher. Oh, and then her okay. sister Selena is um, finds some issues in her career. It, she was she's the one who believes mm -hmm. that she's she's never been Mexican enough for her family and never white enough for her colleagues. So mm -hmm. she you know faces those type of challenges in her career um, in an advertising agency. Mm -hmm. 
So it's just really about, uh, and it, this all takes place over the course of one year in their lives oh. because so much happens and just basically how they, they come back together as a family. I see. I don't know if you want to give out plot details, but is there a tragedy? What, what is the tragedy? Can you tell us that? Sure. So the tragedy is that Wilita passes away oh, in, the middle, in the middle oh, of the book. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And um, the thing about the PE teacher now, that's not, is it wrong to have a relationship if you're a teacher in a Catholic school? As opposed um, to being, not nuns, I think they can't really have a relationship, right? I understand. But. Right. So she's not a nun. She's just yeah. a teacher. Okay. But um, there, yeah, there's different things that happen that kind of, um, she, so she of the four cousins, um, she is the one who is very religious. Ah. And so, um, you mm. know, the, the book alternates points of view of each of the cousins. Oh, that's interesting. So in her chapters, she um, is, has conversations with God uh -huh. um, because she's very faithful. Yes. And so, yeah, it does definitely, this new relationship definitely, you know, kind of question, makes her question um, not really her faith, but whether or not um, what she's doing at this school is mm. is where she needs to be. Mm, okay. But what's going on in her mind? Is it that she's afraid of having a sexual relationship or maybe this is not the right man for her because he's not Christian or Catholic? Um, what, what is the uh, caveat here? The more uh, it's more of the she's she's never really had a relationship, not mm -hmm. because not because of her her religious her religious nature, right. but more than she's just had bad experiences in oh, the past. I see, and is um, just so very hesitant. Yeah, so she doesn't trust maybe a man or right. man, uh, to do right. it. Okay, I see what you're saying. Uh, the other one is kind of interesting um, cultural societal topic about being me not Mexican enough. Not being white enough. Now, does that happen in the real world? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that particular, um, you know, those particular experiences, um, you know, I've had those experiences in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up, um, I grew up as part of a very large Mexican-American family. My dad um, was from Mexico. Yes. Um, my mom is um, first generation. So she was born in the United States. Um, but her parents are from Chihuahua. Oh. And so she, when my dad came here, he spoke no English. Uh. And my mom spoke some Spanish, but mm. was not, you know, she grew up in a time where uh. it was, she was looked down upon for, for exactly. speaking Spanish. And right. it right. was very, you know, it was more important to assimilate than, you know, be proud of your, right. your culture. Yeah. So when we were growing up, um, my dad was trying to learn English, and so we we picked up Spanish, but we were never fluent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had experiences with, um, you know, both sides of the coin where somebody, you know, looks at me and thinks that maybe I'm not educated or um, other stereotypes mm. because I have brown skin. And then on the other side, you know, people who look like me would start talking to me in Spanish and wow. expecting me to have full conversations. And then when I have to, I can only go to a certain point and then I have to start speaking in English oh, and, then, okay. you know, just kind of, you know, being looked <laughs> down upon as, you know, I'm not, I'm not a real Latina because I can't, right. I'm not fluent. Wow. It's a very interesting dynamic here. You know, I had uh, yesterday, I was at the book festival. One of our authors I interviewed was actually a lady that promotes bilingual education culturally for the kids. And she has a, a fun book. I think it's called Orozco, Pollo, and Apple Pie. Uh, <laughs> and then another one, uh, she tells, I have a secret about a little boy that's afraid to speak Spanish uh, with his parents at the PTA meeting because he's embarrassed that mm -hmm. his parents don't speak English. So I think it looks like it goes both ways. Yes. Are you are you a proponent of uh, bilingual cultural multicultural education for kids like Spanish and English or, or no? Oh yeah, I, I would definitely support that, and I think it's important. Um, you know, when I was when I was younger, it was it wasn't um, um, you know something that I was right? worried yeah. about, right? Oh, or but when when I was old, when I'm older now, ah. I can see. Yes. The importance, you yeah. know, of, of you got a lot of readers that are Spanish, but possibly right, right, if you, if you right. Did. And my book, my books have some Spanish in them, yes. um, or more Spanglish, you yes. will. 
Um, so, you know, because I, that's how I grew up talking also. Right, right. So, but I definitely, um, am a supporter of bilingual education. Right. I guess it could, it could still be translated into Spanish, but you would have to learn a little Spanish to speak about it. I would think. Right. But that's great that you have this, um, market you're reaching very unique market, right? Latinos. Yes. In yes. The US. Now, I'm not sure what the authors, when you interview them, some like to reveal the details and the ending and some don't. How do you feel about that? Would you like to reveal the ending in some way? Um, but, for, so. for Big Chicas Don't Cry, I'm, there's like, there's a couple of, because it's four different cousins. So there's basically like four different endings. <laughs> um, so I would probably prefer that readers uh, find out for themselves. Okay. You want them to read the book. Okay. That's yeah, a good book. Just because uh, it's, it's more not because there's like a twist or anything, but it's more about just going on the journey with the cousins ah, and okay. seeing how they their lives ah. change from the beginning of the book to the so end. So there of the are four book. different endings for the four cousins in a way, right? right. Uh, but is there a joint ending for all all the four of them as friends? Yes. So well, definitely at the end of the book, they are back together as okay. part, as, you know, oh, as right. part okay. of the bigger family. So it's yeah. kind of a, uh, maybe a happy ending in some ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely a happy ending. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. That's good. Because sometimes it could be a sad ending, you know, like, a, you know, something uh, negative. Uh, but, no, you know, it's kind of no, like, a um, uh, you know, the term bittersweet, you know? Right. Like, you right. know, like Titanic. I mean, it was kind of sad, but then, you know, it was very spiritual. The ending. <laughs> <Remember> that? <laughs> uh, so what is the message we can take from the Big Chicas? Is there any kind of message, like, that we can learn? Um, I think probably the, the main message is that even though you know your your relationship with your family is complicated that they're really the only ones who may be there for you when you really need it and so sometimes it's better to forgive and keep those relationships okay interesting now uh, i believe you've written two books is that correct two novels yes uh, and the newest one uh, came out was it last year uh no last month march oh, wow that's pretty even quick okay too soon for adios. By the way, I love your titles. They're kind of cool. Because uh, I think the big boys don't cry or something. I think that's a song, isn't it? Yes. Uh, big big girls don't cry. Oh, uh -huh. big girls don't cry. And then uh, too soon for adios. That's kind of a very, um, this could be a powerful, um, you know, theme, right? Yes. That, uh, you have to say goodbye, but you don't want to. I mean, it could be a loved one that's dying or something like that, right? Or something else. Right. But in this case, apparently the mother died and, the, and at the funeral, the biological dad of the daughter shows up. And he wants to get back with her in some way. And he offers her a house, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then initially she doesn't want it, but she says, okay, two conditions. I can sell it anytime I want. And I don't have to have anything, have any, I don't have to have anything to do with you. Right. Well, so that sets it up in an interesting way. Tell us about that story. Um, yeah. So this book is about really, uh, well, one, on one hand, it's about grief and the different ways people go through their grief and um, learn how to, to move on with their lives. Um, and then it's also about reconnecting or not reconnecting, but discovering your past and through that, how you also, you know, connect to your heritage. Hmm. Okay. Now I'm thinking about this on a personal level. Um, and that, let's say that your dad or even your mom disappeared for many years. And who knows, sometimes there's drug abuse or, you know, other problems, whatever it might be. And they come back later in your life and you already have established maybe a, another parent or whatever, or a family. Would you say yes or no? Would you reject them or accept them? Um, I think, I think for me personally, it would, I guess it would just have to depend on one, why are you coming back into my life right now? Right. And also, um, would having you in my life be a good thing? So okay, I, I would well, definitely make sure, you know, that whatever is going to happen is only going to be something that doesn't cause me any more hurt. Hmm. But would you want to know why they left you? I would think that'd be maybe a, a question or would it make a difference? What if they say I was too young or I don't know, I was too immature versus i don't know uh, they i was in jail for 10 years or something uh, would right. any, any yeah, of those no, make I a difference think, to you or no yeah the the difference the, the why i would definitely want to know because i would be curious 
But again, I think it would be more of, I don't want to be focusing on the past. It would be, oh, okay. what is our present relationship going right. to be and how is that going to affect my okay. current life? So if they're going to contribute to your life in a positive way, then you would embrace them as a way. Right. But right. would you still consider them to be your, your dad or mom? Uh, or would you consider your the one who raised you to be your dad or mom? Um, I would consider the one who raised me to be. If if they've earned that title, then yes. I, just because somebody else walks back into my life, I wouldn't you know just give it to them because they're right. biology, biologically they're, related. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you have two moms or dads now, right? Because maybe two right. different kinds. Now in this book, again, the same question: Can you tell us what uh, you know the what happened, or do you want to hold that uh, you know story? Uh, well, I can I can go into a little bit more. Um, so yes. so the the house that the the her biological father is offering her is in New Mexico. Yes, and she lives in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And at first, she does reject him because um, she was raised by um, a step stepfather who right. she considers her dad, and so she yes. doesn't want to have have anything to do with um, this man. But because of um, different things that she's also um, struggling financially because she had to quit her job mm. to take care of her mom who was dying of cancer. Oh. So she's very, um, she's having a lot of financial problems and it's just eventually she does see it as, well, this is, this is, you know, the answer that I need that's going to help me put me back on my feet. So, okay, fine. I will move to New Mexico. Um, to sell the house and I'm going to take the money from that house and, you know, start a new life basically. So when she gets to this little town, which it's the fictional town in New mm -hmm. Mexico that I created, um, her, her whole, her whole attitude is I don't want to have anything to do with this man. And I don't want to have anything to do with this town. I'm just here to sell the house. So of course, this town is going to eventually win her over mm. and she's going to find out that um, the town I had this fictional town that I created. Um, I have it being found by her uh, great, great grandparents mm. um, who, and her great, great grandmother who was um, an Adelita, which is the female soldiers who, Oh. Fought in the Mexican Revolution. Wow, this is on, on the dad on the dad side, the biological this dad is side. On the dad side, oh, yes. Okay. Wow. So, so the town is much more. She learns she's, it's much more than just mm. you know where she's living. This is actually connected to her past. Wow. And her dad uh, turns out is also a cook. She is she's a chef, oh, okay. and so through cooking. Mm. Um, and through cooking old recipes that she finds oh. that belong to her great grandfather, yes. she um, they begin to kind of heal wow. their their relationship. That's really great. So it sounds like a, a like maybe a happy ending for the for the father and daughter possibly. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So you don't really like unhappy endings. It sounds like so far, or like <laughs> or, or, or bit, bittersweet. You know, like where someone dies and you love them forever or something. You haven't done that kind of thing. Um, no, I think for me, it's, well, I, like you mentioned, I also write romance. So for me, yes. romance is all about the happily was, ever after. Part, yeah. <laughs> so I prefer those type of, and I prefer endings that are hopeful. Okay, good. You want to give people inspiration. Although right. some people like, uh, the tragic, uh, you know, bittersweet endings. Some people like those. Yes. Like, yes. especially no. the movies, like, you know, movies, you often sometimes see the, the hero gets killed, but he's, you know, love forever or something. Oh, no, no. I prefer everybody no. to to have some type of good thing happen to them at the end. You, you know, the, the journey may be rough and the journey may be sad, but at the end of it, I want my mm. readers to walk away and, and you know, just be happy with how mm. everything turned out. What do you think are some of the biggest um, issues for Latinos today, relationship problems, family issues uh, that they're facing? And... Um, in the world um you know there's I, I don't know if i can just pick one um <laughs> there's a lot of issues well, I you think, mentioned the thing about blending the cultures together and then you losing it maybe losing yeah. the old culture versus the new culture what do you, yeah, what do you see I, th about there? I think well i think there's there's two two things two sides one is like you mentioned um 
you know, there's, you know, second generation, third generation Latinos who are living in the United States who um, are trying to connect to that culture again. And I think it's definitely within those groups, you know, there is more of um, some pride. Um, Before you go on, let me bring Jonathan, my producer. Jonathan? Sure. Uh, he's, uh, I think, a third generation Latino. Are you third generation, uh, Jonathan? First. Oh, you're first? Yeah. So you were born here? Yeah. Were your parents from from, from Mexico? Uh, yeah. Well, my, my mother... Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm one time. Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> My father was born in Jalisco. Okay. My mother was born in the U.S. Ah. Her mother, my grandmother, yes. uh, migrated. Okay. Would you consider yourself acculturated to American, like you don't really speak a lot of Spanish and have Latino interests, or are you a blend? I would consider myself a blend, but because of my upbringing, because of my upbringing probably more Americanized, but okay. I still try to hold on to my roots. Right. He's like a nerdy producer, uh, hip <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> a Latino, right? Hey, hablo español, uh, poquito, no? yeah. poquito, okay. I guess. So, what do you say to Jonathan? What's your advice to young people like him and others uh, in the new in the new generation for Latino? Um, I think it would, you know, definitely be proud of your roots and your culture, mm -hmm. and um, as much as you can, share that with um, your children or those, you know, younger cousins. Um, I think. When we're younger, when I was younger, it wasn't, um, I, I don't think I had that sense of, I need to be, you know, connected. Mm -hmm. I need to, you know, mm -hmm. be proud. Um, ask you, do, do you and, celebrate Dia de los Muertos? Or no? Not really, no. Okay, she, okay so doesn't do that. I mean, I like dressing up. I like taking <laughs> shots. You know, but I like the whole theme. I like you're you're celebrating those out of past time. Yes, kind of, okay. Yes. I do like that. Do, do you like that also, Annette? Do you spot the, yes, the other yes. We, we celebrate it in my house. Um, okay. But that, again, that was something that came later. I didn't grow oh, up right. celebrating it, okay. but now I do because I wanted. I, I like you. I liked that idea as well. Is just honoring. Those who have um, right. passed, right. and so yes, that's a tradition now that we I've okay. started with my own family. Excellent. And you're okay with tacos, enchiladas, and burritos? Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jonathan, for dropping by. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea because I mean, some of your I guess things talk um, touch on multiculturalism. It sounds like uh, the blending of the cultures. Yes. Now, how, how do you come up with your characters and your plot? Uh, you said one day and just get inspired. Uh, do you research it? Is it from your own history, your own family life, or your personal life? Well, for the for the first book, Big Chicas Don't Cry, um, that was definitely taken from. It's a fictional family, but it was definitely inspired by my own um, extended family. Oh, okay. I also had a abuelita who um, I was very close with, ah. and I was also very close with my um, my grandma, mm. and you know, I have a lot of cousins, so. My relationship with my cousins is taken, um, or the, the relationship of the cousins in the book is definitely taken mm. from my own relationship oh. with my cousins. Right. Um, in the book, there's a scene in the beginning and at the end of the book um, where the whole family, all the women in the family get together to make tamales on the morning of Christmas Eve, oh. and that is something that my family um, does. I love, I love so, tamales. It's good stuff. Yeah, there. so... <laughs> So the first book, um, definitely taken from, inspired by my life and my family. And then um, the second book, uh, Too Soon for Adios, um, that was actually inspired by my husband's um, family. Um, he he was raised by a single mother. And then um, his, his stepfather came into the picture when he was um, a teenager and took over raising him or helped raise him. And he considers um, his stepfather, his father. And that was just, you know, sometimes, you know, the conversation would come up like, you know, what would happen if your biological dad came knocking on the door one day and wanted to have a relationship with you? So that was, so that was the, what was the trigger, I guess, for this story. The second okay. book. So you are drawing then from your personal history and life and so forth. Yes. And yeah. that uh, makes it a strong story. And um, now when you write these things, do you ever like either cry or even experience emotions 
from your past or things like that? Maybe about your abuelita. Uh, oh I- yeah, definitely. I I every single time I read the book, mm-hmm. um, because you know I need to look up something for the book, yes. and I'll just get caught up in it. And mm-hmm. that scene where she mm-hmm. dies. Oh no! Makes, even, <laughs> makes me I, cry. Even now, I can notice a little bit of feeling. Yeah, yeah. But but I guess that makes a great passionate writer. You know, who can do that is to bring the emotional, you know, yeah, tone to the writing. And uh, what advice would you give other Latino or Latina writers and writers in general, but especially maybe Latino Lat- Latina, because uh, they may not even think they can write. You know, maybe that's something they never thought about an actual novel or book like you do. Uh, and you probably speak to them too, no? Some of your uh, talks. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your yes. advice to, to them? Um, my my main advice is, well, to anybody who wants to be a writer, a published author, is to find some sort of writing community, um, whether that's in person or online. Um, one, you'll be able, you know, you'll learn about craft, you know, they'll help you become a better writer. Um, and then two, it's just, for me, it's very inspiring because um, I have a lot of author friends and it's inspiring when I hear about their successes, when they're getting, you know, new contracts or their new book is coming out. It, you know, it makes you excited for, for them, but it also um, reignites that um, that feeling in you that you want to continue um, being an author. You want to continue having success. So I definitely think in surrounding yourself with other writers is positive, uh, will only be positive for you. So, and then <laughs> as far as specifically, um, Latina or Latino writers, um, I think I would say, you know, we're, we're not each other's competition. Mm. Um, it's, you know, that if one success Somebody's other success could open a door for somebody else down the line. And I think it's important that just because, for example, my books are about a Mexican-American person or a Mexican-American family, that doesn't mean that another Mexican-American author's book is going to be exactly the same. Um, Just because we're... We have so many diverse experiences that we have so many stories to tell. So just because you see this book that kind of sounds like a book like you're in, you you want to write, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still write it because your your own experiences that you bring to the writing is going to is what's going to make it be different. Fantastic. And that, well, you're an inspiration to writers, Latino writers, Latina writers, and and also people that have uh, family, you know, be conflicts and issues relationship issues uh because like i said love family and living your dreams that's really i think what you're doing i'm glad yes. that you're very optimistic about it it's your hopeful writer <laughs> you have a you know, happy ending which is nice uh, people need that in you know times of turmoil you know in the world and things going on to have right. uh, inspiration and reading is very powerful to do that and we need to get more readers i think at the book festival yes. there are a lot of people walking around looking like they like books so that's a good thing but yes, even though is. nowadays they have ebooks and other stuff, you know, and in different ways, but as long as they can read the words, that's what counts. Where can people hear more about you? Get your books and all that kind of stuff. Uh, um, so you can um, go to my website, which is www.authorannette.com. Um, or I'm also on Instagram um, as author Annette. And um, if you'd like to know more about my romance books, um, my website for that is www.sabrinasoul.com. Perfect. Is there any book coming out in the near future we can anticipate, as far as you know? Um, right now, I do have another romance book coming out I am in November. Wow. wow. It's um, a cowboy, cowboy oh, romance. Oh, I think I read a little bit about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is and, and, um, and my cattle, series. Is it called Vaqueros? Is that the term? But, the Vaqueros, yeah. Vaqueros, okay. A handsome cowboy. So, That's always really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that one, it will be coming out in at the end of November. Oh, fantastic. All right, that has been a wonderful having you on the show. Mucho gusto. Uh, great pleasure. And until we talk again, have a wonderful week. And keep the writing and inspiring people. Oh, thank you so much. So that was a great interview live at the Los Angeles Book Festival at USC. We had an amazing time. And this is a great opportunity to interview these wonderful authors and people that have a message that's going to help others. 
So love you, university students. If you want to be on the show in the future, or if you have a show idea, you want to comment on today's show, you can reach us at 310-226-8090. You can write to us at loveuniversitylove at gmail.com. You can visit us at loveuniversitylove. You can also download the podcast on Podbean, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iTunes. You can like us and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Love University Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Love Letter U Podcast. And you can also go to our YouTube channel, Love University. So until next time, this is Dr. Alex Avila. It's time to put away your notebooks, your iPads, your phones. And class is now dismissed. Love yourself, others, and the higher nature. Until next time.